um, starting with the pledge. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out to the January 18th Board of Education regular business meeting. And we will move right to the agenda with our superintendent's report, Mr. Michael Brooks, superintendent of schools. Uh, good evening, President Horton. Thank you very much for coming tonight. We appreciate your time. And we've got some youngsters here that are being recognized for some wonderful things. So I'll be as quick as I can so we can get to the recognitions, but I do want to give the board and certainly the public some information about some of the happenings uh, recently. Uh, first of all, early in the month of December, I was approached by a member of the Marlboro Milton Lions Club, um, who typically on an annual basis, the Lions Club works with our uh, kindergarten screening process to also do a visual screening for uh, youngsters. And they have some special equipment at the Lions Clubs in many communities uh, used to help out with that uh, screening process. It just so happens this last summer, the number of screenings that the Lions Club was able to get to was very small. And um, they came up with the idea of trying to work with our nursing staff at the elementary school to try to do a full screening for every child and family that would like to have that screening in one day at the elementary school. So we connected the um, Mr. Peter Lyons from the Milton Marlboro Lions Club and our elementary staff, and they're in the process of scheduling that out so we can get a, a screening universally across the board for all of our kindergarten students. Such a wonderful service that's provided by the Lions. But we also established a good connection with some Lions members. Um, it happens to be a tenant of the, generally, of Lions Clubs to deal with vision and vision-related um, ailments for especially children. So, I believe, Ms. Walsh, you were telling me that there was a youngster that had a need for glasses and that was filled almost immediately with the connection that was established with the Lions Club. So thank you very much to the elementary school, but certainly most thank you to the Milton, the Marlboro Milton Lions Club. So wonderful thing, and I'll pass the letter back and forth so the board can see the letter regarding this. Just, that's my only copy, so if I get that back when you're done. Um, also, uh, Mr. Wither and I are going to be traveling to Albany next week to meet with our local elected, elected officials at the state level, Senate and Assembly. Um, certainly, things are now in full swing with the governor laying out his proposed budget for the 18-19 school year for the state's next fiscal year. Um, it's a process that typically begins in January and ends somewhere around April 1st for the state. Why that's critical for us? The number that they finally land on as far as state aid is a critical element of the budget formation that this board considers as we develop the 2018-2019 budget. So I guess with that statement, we've officially begun the budget process for the 18-19 school year. Uh, Mr. Witherow actually will be speaking tonight regarding um, our five-year uh, fiscal position and our strength and his, his projection as far as where we are in our fiscal plan. So, Mr. Widow, thank you very much for what you're going to be doing tonight. Um, there's also some discussion that's being had at the high school and middle school, and there will be further discussion at the high school and middle school at our district-wide safety teams regarding the traffic patterns, both at the middle school and also at the high school. Uh, we're always trying to adjust the flow of cars and people, especially during arrival and dismissal. There can be some challenging times there, um, depending upon the, the situation. It's a very different situation at the middle school than it is at the high school. At the middle school, it's primarily parents, kids, and buses. At the high school, it's parents, kids, and buses also, but some of those kids also drive themselves. So there's a different dynamic there that our safety team and our administrative staff is closely looking at to see if we can make some adjustments to any of that um, to make things safer. So I know Mr. Lawler has begun some of that process with Mr. Cordellano and I believe Officer Mastin, I don't see Mr. Lawler. Oh, there he is over there. Um, 
Do you want to just give us a quick 30 second primer on where you are with, please, yeah, for the recording, yep. Good evening. So our issue is primarily at dismissal and we're looking at ways to make dismissal more efficient and more safe. Um, we have just a large volume of students that get picked up and our students who are leaving at the same time the buses are leaving. Um, so we're, we're working through plans right now. Um, we'd like to take that, like you said, through the safety committee though before we unveil the details. So thank you very much. Sir. Sure. Um, also, the Board of Education has a very important goal that focuses on our academic program, but most specifically targets in on science, technology, engineering, art, and math, STEAM, STEM type of programming. And Ms. Hecht has a brief update for the board as we are here now in the middle of the year. It's been quite a bit of work that's been going on in this area, so Ms. Hecht, if you could kind of give us some perspective. And I believe you're also going to speak regarding the springtime superintendent's conference days and the agenda change so yes. the board is aware. So I'll speak to that first. So our 425 and 515 uh, scheduled professional development days were scheduled to use as scoring days for the state assessments. This year, we are moving towards the computer-based assessments and all students three through eight will be taking those. And therefore, we will this year be sending our tests out to be scored online. Um, so those days now will not be used for scoring, but instead will be used to work. Um, I know you read in my board, Graham, the Mid-Hudson Teacher Grant that we received for $2,500. So we'll be using that presenter to come in and work with our K-5 teachers on vocabulary, uh, phonics instruction and to continue that initiative with literacy and then the other buildings are now returning uh, their requests back for working on curriculum for assessments um, and those type of uh, articulation between the grade levels so we will be keeping those days but just using them a little differently okay then for our um, MST stem steam stream initiative <laughs> I'm so com I don't know which one to use anymore but um, we are moving forward with that. The state's focus is on what role is technology playing in the instructional world. So we are focusing on teaching and learning and assessment. This uh, computer-based testing is one of the areas, but we're also mimicking that in the classroom. So you saw in my notes that we are doing um, mock CBTs, but we're also designing our assessments online. So trying to help our students get prepared for college and career and moving in that direction. We've had one meeting so far, two were scheduled, one just got canceled the other day uh, due to snow, but um, our six through 12 STEM meeting took place in the high school, and that was to gather data. I'm sorry, I thought you were pointing something. Or I'm left-handed, so when somebody goes to move my elbow, I'm like, oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we talked about how we're using technology in the classroom, how is it advancing students, where, where are we now, where will we go with that, and how do we get there? So we were, had that same meeting scheduled for yesterday at the elementary uh, building. Of course, snow kept us from doing that, but we're going to reschedule. We have one with the high school next week on the 24th, and I'm hoping to schedule the one for the elementary on the 25th, the very next day, and um, to have that conversation. So I'll be working um, with Mr. Morallo and our intern for the middle school to um, put that in motion. An interesting piece too that's kind of uh, evolving and I think that's one of the reasons why we struggle with some acronyms here. MST, Math, Science, Technology, STEAM, Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math, S STEM, Sti Science, Technology, Engineering, and Math. Well there's an art in there which is Reading. VA. But it started to become an acronym <laughs> that was every subject that we teach. So quite honestly, the way that the, di the dialogue has moved is looking at what programming are we currently offering to children and are there areas that we need to make some adjustments in so that we're offering not just more but better programming that's focused on where students need to be at some point in time. And why I'm being vague about that is that Ms. Hecht and I are kind of looking at it as a 2030 vision. 
and that's our current kindergarten class. They're graduates in the year 2030. So if we're to project where do our kindergartners need to be as they're graduates, well, that's a long-term vision that does help us in looking at what programs we're offering in our elementary level, in our middle school level, and in our high school level, and are we focusing on the right things? There are three guiding questions that we've used for all curriculum matters. Are we teaching the right things? Are we teaching the right things well? And how do we know? And those have been the foundational elements of our curriculum work as we always move to evolve to better things. So, Ms. Heck, thank you very much for, for taking this initiative on. And, and certainly we as a, as a group of professionals, collectives, uh, look forward to where we're going to end up. So. You're welcome. It's exciting. Yes. Um, can I ask you a question? Sure. What, is there a specific outcome you're expecting out of these meetings, or is it more of a plan and approach uh, to meet what you just described, Mike? I think it is what Mr. Brooks just described. So how are we getting to that? So there are discussions, answering our three questions, <coughs> you know, trying to see what we can repurpose in our districts and you know, what we Okay. We need to move forward. Yeah, so, I don't think that we, to answer directly too, I don't think we have an expected outcome. And I think that was a, a choice that Ms. Hecht and I made as we moved into this because we didn't want to have a determined end as we challenged, quite honestly, our professional staff to figure out what are we not doing that we should be doing. That's really what it comes down to. Because the conversation quickly moved away from just the technology and an engineering side to so many other elements that we didn't want to limit the conversation. So what starts with, sure, we want to look at math, science, and technology, and where are we with that in programming, became, yeah, but what about this? And what about this? And what about this? And not wanting to limit any of those dialogues um, really turned out to be a pretty rich conversation as a great starting point. So we look forward to some okay. outcomes, what they are. It's too early to tell. It's hard to pinpoint, too, because each day something else comes up. So, you know, we're taking a trip to Wappinger Falls to look at their makerspace because we're building our makerspace. But there's no definite end to it. It can keep turning. We're having a Google certification class for our students as well as our teachers. So these things just keep coming, and we keep grabbing them and seeing how we can fit them in and how do they support, you know, the standards, the new standards that are there and how we're preparing the students. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Thank you very much. And also a, a mid-year update here, which is really some new information. Um, Ms. Mealy has taken on an initiative with our, um, our mental health staff and is beginning to look at our system, our offerings, and, and um, actually I'll just pass it over to you so you can do a better job of explaining it. <laughs> Thank you. What we are doing in the mental health um, department over the next few months is we'll be meeting with each building individually to get the teacher's perspective on what are the social emotional needs of their students. Um, we have met as a mental health team and we know what our perception of it is. However, we're not the teachers within the classroom who deal with teaching math and students that are struggling either at home or, or socially emotionally. So we're gonna start by doing these open forums in all three buildings and use the information we gather from those forums to create programs, um, resources, and workshops to support both those students, the parents, and the staff. So like Mr. Cantone's question, what's our desired outcome? Our desired outcome is to create program and workshops to support the students. So we want varying perspectives to see what is that gonna look like. So once we gather the information from the teachers, um, at one point, you know, we would like to do it for parents as well to get their perceptions as to what we can do to help their students. Um, we're seeing a growing number of students in need of various levels of social emotional support. So to kind of target our instruction and support in a better way, um, we want to, you know, gather as much information as we can and then move forward in a positive way. So. Already it's very interesting and exciting. They have all these great ideas. So the next step is to get the teacher's perspective, which we're excited to do, and we'll be doing that um, throughout the month of February. I, I do know the state has been pushing on that, too, for each. For um, When I go to conference, that's one of the biggest things right now is the mental health mm -hmm. for all schools to bring in clinics. So my question is, when you're doing this with all the teachers and sitting down and having conversations with them, because um, you said you wanted to bring in 
um, a forum and you want to have parents come, how would you, that's for all the students district-wide, correct? Right. In the past, we've done parent workshops on various um, issues. We did a parent workshop on school avoidance um, and anxiety. Um, we want to see if that's exactly what we should be doing or do we need to go in a different direction. We have used outside um, agencies to do those workshops. However, there are, there are workshops and forums that we could do within district with our own staff. I know anxiety is one of the biggest things and, and also the bullying thing. So is there a way to add that into? Because that, also, that is also a big mental health issue is the bullying and maybe bring the parents in for that. It's going gonna, it's gonna to become what the data leads us to do. So if that is certainly something that is brought up throughout the buildings or by a parent group, then, then yeah, we'll come up with something to address you know, bullying. Good. So I don't want to say, yes, we're going to do well, it, because right. if that's not one of the prevalent like said, issues and I something knew. else is, but. Right. Like I said, anxiety, I know, is one of the things, and, and socializing is another big thing for these kids nowadays. Um, so I think we're going forward in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in case you can't tell from the, the level of dialogue, uh, we're fully involved in planning for 2018, 2019, which is kind of crazy since we're only four months into the school year. But believe it or not, budget planning has begun. Course registrations and advisement has begun at the high school and middle school level, or at least the planning stages of that. And annual reviews in the special education world, those have also begun. All of that work is planning for this spring and summer and creating those master schedules and opening up the doors in September. So it's a it's a wild ride between now and, and, uh, and June. So uh, stay tuned and pay attention. Um, another side there, too, uh, the board is aware of this, but it's important to remind, too, that we're fully involved at this point also in the evaluation process. So our building level administrative staff, um, certainly a, a good number of our second, uh, central level staff, including myself, go into classrooms and conduct observations. I personally go in and observe all non-tenured staff, all four years of their uh, non-tenured uh, time here, and have great dialogue with them on what I saw, what I understood, and quite honestly, really learning about what their goals are on a professional level. How have they seen themselves change over time, and what do they see as their future with us? So it's a real rewarding experience and um, something I actually absolutely cherish. So we're fully moving in that process and I know that there's a few people right now that are trying to schedule their observations with me that have higher levels of anxiety as they realize that I'm scheduled now through February so they're scheduling towards the end of February at this point and there, there's a lot of them so it's a good process and I appreciate the uh, opportunity to go into classrooms um, I also have asked the Board of Education to take a look at our Board of Education meetings coming up, most specifically uh, this June, and if it's fine the way it is, we can keep it that way, but there are two, me oh, Mr. Berger, I just noticed you there. Mr. Berger is a representative from the Orange Ulster School Boards Association, uh, School District, excuse me, BOCES. Yeah. Um, we have two board meetings in June, June 7th and June 21st. That would be the first and third Thursday. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. I just want to remind the board that the 22nd, the day after the 21st, graduation. is graduation. So if there's a need for us to make any adjustments to that schedule, that's fine. We can do that. We're just, I mean, we don't necessarily need to, but it's is something it, we might want to look at. I do have a question. The night before graduation, I believe the high school, if I'm not mistaken, does a lot with the kids and that we are, we are involved with doing the um, school, um, Scholarships, I believe it is, the night before? Yeah, the senior awards night. Right, so that, that night. Right, right. so that's, that's why that I'm asking the board as far as, yeah. right. So it's for discussion, so. I mean, I would like to change it to a different night because that is one of the best here. nights of the year is to go see the kids get that and be with all the kids that are graduating and also, unfortunately, saying goodbye to them and they're moving on, which is a positive thing. So. Okay, so as we progress down the next couple of meetings, that's something we might want to make an adjustment on. Just putting it on your radar for, yep. for general purposes. And, and also maybe finding out when BOCES has their graduation. Because we have kids graduating from CTEC. That's that Wednesday night. Uh-huh. It's a busy week. 
apparently. <laughs> Just so I'm clear, the, the awards night is the 21st, the day before graduation? Okay. Uh, and then also in the coming, um, potentially next meeting even, some dialogue, if not this, this evening, on this summer's meetings. So I would ask that the board consider at least two business meetings. One would be uh, the reorganization meeting in July, and then one business meeting in August. As far as school district, district operations, those, those would be the only two meetings that I would need but I know this board is also interested, as we did last year, in a, uh, in a retreat. So we need to start putting our eyes on dates for that, not the least of which so each one of us can plan for that date, but also we can secure a, um, a presenter for us, a facilitator. So The 12th is a reorganization. I would propose it to be July 12th. Remember, the, the uh, law requires either the first couple of days of July or within the first two weeks by board action. It's if we were to go the, the fifth, prior, right? exactly, the, the first Thursday is the 5th of July, and that's never a good time for board meetings, but we can have it on the 12th. We would just need to have an action by the board to uh, designate it at that, that we time. Didn't, I thought we did that already. We did not. We did not, okay. We did it last year okay. for last summer, True. but now it's time to go for this summer. So we can certainly have some dialogue on that and put it on perhaps next agenda even as a discussion item all right sounds good um, and the last piece I have a uh, handout for the board the Elster County School Boards Association has uh, distributed their request for distinguished friends of education awards so if this board is so interested you have that already good so yep. the uh, document is here we can certainly add it to an agenda for discussion and decide if there's someone that we would like to send on for that recognition. Yeah. All right? Yes. And with that, I'm done. Okay. Thank you. We will move on to our um, student representative report with our student representative, Isabella Martinez. Thank you. And we will go back to you, Mr. Brooks, for one of this evening's highlights, which is Student of the Month. Terrific. Thank you very much. Let's up. Uh, by the way, the Elementary Student of the Month, there's a family uh, illness, so 
push them to the February meeting because some family members couldn't make it. And it's all about the families tonight. So we'll start with the middle school. Good evening. Thank you, Mr. Brooks and the board. As always, it's a pleasure to be here to announce our uh, student of the month. Uh, this month's student is one of the most uh, bubbly, positive, encouraging, polite students that I've had the pleasure to work with. There's not a day goes by I don't get a nice hello uh, and some kind of you know pleasant commentary. So it's my pleasure to call up her teachers, uh, Mrs. Carbone, Ms. Kellogg, and Mrs. Messina to speak on Olivia Laird. It is my pleasure to get to present this student with Student of the Month. What we did was a poem, an acoustic poem, about Olivia. And these are some adjectives that we would use to describe her. She is definitely optimistic. She's loving. She's intelligent. She's vivacious. She's a leader. And she is ambitious. Um, I have to say, on a personal note, I really wanted Olivia to be one of my students this year because I knew she was an outstanding student because my kindergartner two years ago was on the bus with her and every day she came home to tell me about Olivia and how Olivia took her on the bus and walked her off the bus and what a great bus mate she was. So I knew way back when that she was a terrific girl and I couldn't wait to be able to teach her. It has been a pleasure. And I just wanted to say from a, a parent perspective, I'm always telling my own daughters, Greet your teachers every day when you walk in and say thank you when you leave. And that's exactly what Olivia does with that beautiful smile every day. So we're lucky enough to be greeted by her every day. And she always says, hi, how are you? Just so happy and um, bubbly, as Mr. Stanmeyer said. I took my but I left out yeah. the <laughs> <laughs> um, So... Olivia has a radiating personality that brightens the room every day with her positive energy and kindness. Uh, she's a hard worker and is determined to do well in all of her academics. She is always offering to help out her teachers and peers. She is an absolute pleasure to have on Team Dukes, and we look forward to seeing Olivia thrive in all of her future endeavors. And again, you know, if my day might not be going as great as soon as she walks in that room, you know, your mood instantly changes. She, you know, she's definitely, a, you know, brightens the room, and we're so glad, you know, you're part of our team. So, good job. Congratulations. Congratulations. Now we'll shift it up to the high school who has two students. Yeah, yeah. 
We had a tie this month. Um, so I met with Mrs. Russo, Mrs. Natoli, and kind of discussed both of our students, and there really is no breaking that tie. We have two young women uh, tonight who join us who are just amazing students in our building. They participate in our community. Um, they're great students, fantastic citizens, and we're very proud of both um, Ariana Brown and Madison Duran. And at this time, I'm gonna ask them to come up along with Mrs. Natoli and Mrs. Russo to introduce them. Um, so it's my pleasure to speak about Madison Duran first. Um, I said that Robert Collier is credited with saying success is a sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. And those words characterize the actions of Madison Duran since she arrived at Marlboro High School and probably before, well before that. I had the pleasure of being her teacher in both ninth and 11th grade, and I feel fortunate to have been working, have worked with the poised, intelligent, empathetic, and motivated young woman who stands before you tonight. Um, as a department, we're really fortunate because we have so many students who shine academically and are outstanding human beings. Uh, Madison is a senior who has contributed so much to our department and our language program, and she is extremely des de deserving of the title of Student of the Month. She excels in the foreign language classroom, and she's not afraid to put into practice what she is studying. She has no fear of, of trying to speak in Spanish and communicate um, in written and... and um, verbal Spanish. Um, it was her excellent use of the Spanish language that earned her uh, my scholar award last year in College Spanish 201. Um, and I remember I was saying one day that she sp said something in class, we were having a debate and she spoke so eloquently about something and one of her classmates you know, mates in Spanish said that was beautiful and it really was. Um, that day stuck with me. This year I have had the good fortune to serve as advisor to the Spanish Honor Society and in the fall she was chosen by her peers as its president. She has run the meetings each month and has also addressed the faculty of the high school as well as the school board on behalf of our group. Um, and this fall, she and a few dedicated members of the Spanish Honor Society designed and implemented a fundraiser to benefit the victims of Hurricane Maria in Puerto Rico. And so I'm pleased to say as a result of their efforts, we were able to contribute $370 last week toward the relief efforts now underway. Um, since junior year, this woman, this young woman has volunteered in our elementary school on a weekly basis to read with young students in the English as a New Language program. And her face lights up when she talks about her experiences. So I know she has grown and learned as much from her involvement with the children as they have, I'm sure. Um, as part of Spanish Honor Society, she is also one of a dedicated group of students who goes to the elementary school each month for family fun night to play games and do crafts with those students um, from families with limited abilities in English. And I'm so proud to work with Madison and that whole group. Um, she, I can honestly say that I've rarely seen Madison in a bad mood and she brings a positivity and some kind of certain light and spirit to all that she does and it can be an infectious motivator to those around her. So I'm truly honored to be able to speak on her behalf tonight. I'm equally as excited to see what life brings for Madison in her future years in college and beyond, and I'm sure she's gonna bring that same level of energy and enthusiasm to everything she does, so congratulations. So um, because of Ariana and Madison's contributions to Spanish Honor Society, these girls have made themselves stand out. Um, it was impossible for us. I can normally narrow it down to just one student, but it was really impossible for us to narrow it down. So we got permission um, to expand it um, because they're so highly qualified. Um, so some things Mrs. Russo has already mentioned, for the past two years, both of these students have gone to the elementary school to read to our Spanish heritage speakers. Um, they both presented, they might look familiar already to some of the board members because they both presented to the Board of Education as officers of the Spanish Honor Society. Um, and they have attended family diversity nights at the elementary school to help with families with limited English. Both of them are in my current College Spanish 202 class with me 
since Mrs. Russo already told you about Madison, I'm going to take the opportunity to share some of my experiences with Ariana. Um, Ariana had asked me to write her a letter of recommendation, um, and so she was trying to come up with some adjectives to describe herself in the form that they have to fill out for the guidance office, and I just started listing a whole bunch, and she was like, wow, that's really good, and I'm like, well, I've been planning this in my head since you were a sophomore. Um, she is an optimist who always strives to improve. She is interested and enthusiastic about learning. Some of these are on her letter of recommendation as well. Um, she never makes excuses. She holds herself accountable for her own success. She's always on task. She's very mature about her education. If a grammatical issue, for example today, she had a question about something that was going to be on the midterm, she does not hesitate to come in and ask for help. Um, her mother speaks Spanish, but she does not depend on her mother for helping her out. She does it all on her own. Um, so her achievements are hers, and that independence is really going to take her far, I believe. Um, I have known Ariana since she was in my Spanish 3 class as a sophomore. I worked with her in drama club then. Um, she does costumes. She's been doing it. She's learned how to do measurements and sewing. Um, when it came to nominate students for Link Crew, I'm the Link Crew advisor, and I knew that I wanted Ariana Brown to be on our team um, because she's a natural leader and she's a perfect role model. Both of these young ladies are. Um, this year, Ariana applied for Link Crew again as a senior, and I immediately asked her to be my commissioner, which is she um, helps, basically it's kind of like the president of Link Crew, um, so she helps plan events and um, helps keep everybody informed of everything. She um, does not love public speaking. I know that might surprise you, but she doesn't love it, but she was willing to speak in front of the board, even though it's not her favorite thing to do. Um, she also doesn't love getting her picture taken, by the way. So this was a real challenge for her. Um, but when she's passionate about something, she comes through. Um, and she's a perfect example. Actually, both of these ladies are perfect examples of poise beyond their years. Um, and so for to both of them, I would like to just say, for all that you guys give to um, the district, you're huge, valuable assets, and it's an honor to be able to recognize both of your efforts and contributions as Students of the Month. Ariana, I was hoping you would join me up here for some public speaking. <laughs> so I guess as I, as I see families looking up here for what do we do next, I, I really love listening to these descriptions of our children and, and talk about what does it take to be a Duke. And I know someone referenced being on Team Duke. Well, you just saw Team Duke. You know, they're bubbly, they're polite, they're empathetic. They shine academically. They ex excel in college Spanish in high school. Wow. They're accountable. They make drama club costumes. They're role models. By the way, Link Crew is the transition program to help eighth graders transition into ninth grade. You're a leader in that. Thank you. We appreciate that. You have you're poised beyond years. Incredible. I think one of the things that I was most impressed with, however, Olivia, is the impact, how old are you, Olivia? 
the impact that an 11-year-old has had on adults. It's, it's, it blows my mind, Olivia, how great your teachers just spoke about you. That really is impactful. So it's something to be so proud of. I'm proud that you're here with us. I'm proud that I'm a Duke, and I'm proud that you're here with us as members of the Duke community. So congratulations to all of you. And for further rec um, recognition, we are going to go right to our spelling bee winners and runners up. Yes, and I'm going to actually pass the torch over to Ms. Hecht, who's going to take care of that. So. And Ms. Messina is going to join me. Okay. So we are in our 16th, 17th, I can't even remember anymore, in <clears throat> year. But we were discussing how that every year the students have the opportunity to participate in the Scripps National Spelling Bee, actually for the past nine decades. So, of course, we have not been doing it for nine decades, but it has been around since then. It began in 1925, and I, I love history, so I just have to share this with you. It began with nine newspapers joined together and decided to host a spelling bee. And it's been held every year since 1925, except for during World War II, the years of 43, 44, and 45. And then it picked right back up again, and it has recently met its 90-year mark. And I was reading some article about it, and they were saying, you wonder if those nine newspapers realized, you know, they've already touched about 11 thousand, 11 million, million, million students since that year. It's pretty cool. So tonight we have the pleasure of introducing to you two of the winners who will be going to Schenectady to represent Marlboro Central School District and some of the finalists that really gave them a run for their money that they had to compete against um, quite a few rounds, right? Really nail biting. <laughs> Very nail biting. <laughs> I think we were up to almost, um, many of the people in this room right now were judges and we were hitting, you know, words up in the hundreds. So we really. <laughs> <laughs> so we will introduce our two winners. Our first winner will be from the elementary school. Would you like to? Congratulations to Jacqueline Rivera. She is our winner from the elementary school. Thank you so much. Jacqueline, can you spell the last word that you had to spell? Chesapeake, capital C-H-E-S-A-P-E-A-K-E. -E -E. Right, and then you went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And our winner for the Marlboro Middle School, who has been the winner for the last three years, two in the elementary school, is Harrison, Harrison Solomon. Harrison, do you remember your word? Thank you. That was probably one of the easier ones, right? Well, we went through the hard ones and we went back through the, we finished the spelling bee and had to go back to start all over, so. In another spelling bee book, like yeah. we kept going, right? We'd also like to bring up with this group some other contestants. And these contestants did amazingly well. They were the ones that we're in the final round with our um, winners. Emma Bojaday. Tyson Fernandez. Jaden Wiles. And those are our elementary school competitors. For the middle school, we have Gianna Barbero. And Claire Devine. We're going to give 
each of you a certificate. They, everyone received a participation medal, and our winners received a plaque, but we did that at the actual spelling bee. Yes, thank you. Thank you. We'd like to thank everyone again for coming out and for your outstanding participation and parenting and we really appreciate all that these students not only bring to our district, but um, show as role models to other students of the district. So thank you very much. We'll take a two minute break so everyone can get their children home and we will resume.
she has to apply yet. They both got giggling. Remember? <laughs> I was like, they were, they were back on tonight, but they didn't do so much giggling, so it's good. Michelle, take care. I think I have some Spanish on here that I actually have to say. I should make her come up here and for the textbook. There's a, I think it, I think it means um, chronicle, chronic, chronicles of death foretold. As I'm, huh? Oh. I think it is. I, well, that was me translating it word for word. It could mean like chronicles of foretold death. <laughs> I don't remember Some which is which. <laughs> yeah. To conclude the reports for this evening, we will have Mr. Patrick Witherow present our mid-year financial review and five-year plan. Thank you. So we're going to just take a look. We do this every time at this time of year where we kind of update our five-year projection on what our financial performance is going to look at look like. So I wanted to start, you know, the governor's proposal came out the other day um, for, for aid to school districts. So we wanted to kind of take a comparison and look at what those numbers look for us, look like for us. And there is a typo on your handout that I just corrected on the screen. Um, the, the blue, that heading was incorrect on your handout. Um, so what we have here, there's a lot of different numbers looking at. This is the governor's proposal in January of 2017. So not the current year, but the previous year. This is the, the state aid numbers that we budgeted for the 17-18 school year. And this number is the projected aid that we're going to receive in 17-18. So that, in terms of a timeline, you know, this came out in January. We have a budget that we developed based on not only the governor's proposal, but also the legislative proposal. Then we get to the point now where they're projecting the aid that we're going to receive for the 17-18 school year, and they have a proposal for the 18-19 school year. So in the newspaper, things looked great because they're showing us an increase of about $465,000 in aid. Unfortunately, that's from their projected 1718 number to the proposed 1819 number. The projected number really means nothing to us because that's an after the fact number. The real number that means anything to us is our budgeted number. So when you look at what our budgeted number is compared to what the governor's proposal is, this, we would be coming up with a decrease of about $51,000 um, compared to what we budgeted to what the governor's proposal. So it's very different than an increase of 465,000. It's actually less money. But even more telling is to look at what the difference between our projected 1718 amount and the, the governor's proposal in 18 um, that's a decrease of about $361,000. So 
So while the numbers look good on paper, or excuse me, that's the projected 1718 number versus the January 17 proposal. So really what they're looking at is saying that the, the, the number we're going to receive is considerably less than what was originally proposed. And when you look at the comparison of the projected, the projected really means nothing to us other than it looks better that we're going to receive an increase when in actuality, as far as we're concerned, it's a decrease because, you know, we're going from budget to budget. Um, <clears throat> So it's just interesting, I wanted to present the numbers so you could get a feel for what the difference is. Um, and if you, you look at the difference between the January 17 proposal and what the 1718 budget wound up being, um, it was a difference of about 155,000. And there's rounding, there's differences between what numbers we have available to us when we actually set the budget and what the state aid numbers actually turn out to be after the process is over. The two are not aligned um, perfectly for us. So we're going to take a look at, this is a form everybody's been familiar with. We've seen this for a couple of years now. Um, we just keep increasing one year out as a year goes by. So this is what our plan would have looked like if we did not have the problem with the Roasten assessment error. Um, as everybody is familiar with the process, um, the town of Newburgh assessor who has resigned from that position as of the end of December, um, forgot to adjust the taxable assessed value of the Roasten power plant. Roasten has been under a court order devaluation schedule. I'm just going to flip through real quick to show you. Um, from the 13-14 school year, where we had a taxable assessed value of $101 million, 200000 every year it's been dropping according to a court order in the bankruptcy proceedings of the power plants of Dynegy. They forgot to change the 51.8 million taxable assessed value of last year to 36.8 million this year. And unfortunately that means that we are gonna be $1.2 million short on our tax collection um, with no, no, no way to compensate for that. We can't make it up, we can't do anything except absorb that loss. So I'm gonna go back. So prior to the Roasten error, error you know, we were in pretty decent shape. We knew that we had some challenges coming up economically. When you look at reserves and fund balance, that's basically the aggregate of our 4% fund balance and what our reserves are. Now, when you get to a point where you start to see the reserves go negative, that actually would result in us being below the 4% fund balance. It's just a math. This is really the number to look at, reserves and fund balance. So you see in this, school year, we're down to about $1.3 million. In 2021, we drop a $500,000 debt payment, and in the next year, we lose a $1.2 million debt payment, which is the tax cert for Central Hudson. Um, so, you know, if we could have gotten from the Dynegy bankruptcies to the point where we reduce some debt payments, you know, that was the game plan. We knew that we had an issue. We knew we had a problem when the power plants went bankrupt and the, the commensurate change in values. Um, but we did have a solid plan to get us back to start coming up the other side once these debt payments dropped off. And just for clarity, you know, these debt payments are shown as dropping off. You know, we'll, we'll talk about what happens in those years as we get closer to those years because those are also the, the prime opportunities if we have any type of capital work that needs to be done. Um, it would be nice to align any additional debt payment with the reduction of this debt payment um, because in the end what you could do is have a net decrease in your debt payments so the taxpayer would not see any increase related to any issuance of debt, while at the same time you would have the possibility to issue debt to um, potentially address capital projects or any type of work that needs to be done within the district. So you see that's a couple- Pat, if I could just chime in on it too, that's just to remind the board and the public, that's going directly to the conversation that the board started having uh, with you and uh, Mr. Cavaza regarding our building condition survey back Correct. in December. So Correct. Those are going to be linked, and we'll certainly be looking for some direction from this board over the coming months 
on how to progress with those BCS issues. Yeah, and th this is the ex this is a great opportunity to do it because the the, the ta there's no net impact to the taxpayer, and this 1.2 million that drops off that's a tax cert payment. We don't receive any building aid associated with that debt. So when the 500 thousand that that has some building aid associated with it. Now, granted, the building aid doesn't cover your entire debt payment, so you still have a net decrease. But you're also going to have a little bit of a decrease in revenue when that drops off. When you get to the 1.2 million, you're not going to see any decrease in building aid because we're not receiving any aid on that debt. So even if you potentially issue new debt at that point, even if you were to issue the 1.2 million exactly on a yearly payment, the net effect would be lower than what we are now because we'd be receiving aid on that debt issuance. And again, we'll talk about that as we go further, but I just want to put that out there so we keep that on the radar. We've talked about that for quite a while now as being a, the opportunity to do something like that, and we'll continue those conversations. Hey, hey Pat. I have a point of clarity on the under the revenues you say reserves does that represent the number we're going to take from reserves and apply to the budget so right here the red appropriated reserves fund balance i was actually above that where it's in the black underneath the appropriated fund balance reserves uh, above underneath the red venues right here well, i can't see where fund balance i'm sorry if you count down from the, the header revenues two four six Six down. See, there's a line item reserves. Oh, reserves. Yeah. Yes, those are the reserves that we are appropriating towards the budget. So okay. that would be our, you know, ERS reserve, um, insurance reserves. We we have detail of that broken out in the actual budget document. This is the aggregate of that. Okay. And when you look at the bottom, you see appropriated reserves fund balance. Right here, we have appropriated fund balance. And again, these numbers right here are more of like placeholders more than likely there'd be some distribution between appropriated fund balance and reserves. And my battery's dying on my pointer, okay, so I think I'm out of luck. So we'll have to, we'll have to wing it from here. <laughs> but um, right, so as you go out past, you know, to 18, 19, 19, 20, even though that appropriated fund balance is a zero line, it's t there's gonna be some split. Like if you look at 18, 19, the 4.11 million, there'll be some split between appropriated fund balance and reserve usage there. but. It's just an aggregate sum, so you, you get a feel for what that impact is. As you see, you know, as we go further along, um, we get to where we significantly reduce. You know, ideally, what we would like to do, you know, when we talk about how we budget, we, we budget at 96% of expenditures, so 4% is kind of a cushion. Ideally, every year we'd want to appropriate about 4% of reserves, and then in a perfect world, at the end of that year, we'd have that money left over that we would then go back to fund reserves. And that becomes our kind of cushion. And John, if you remember, we had a lot of conversations a number of years ago about getting to this point because prior to us building our cash position, we had to tax to build that 4%. Where now that we have the money, we're just appropriating it. If we don't spend it, we're refunding the reserves, appropriating refunding, that type of situation. So we, we thought we were in pretty good shape until we find out there's a problem with Roasten. So once we look at the problem with Roasten, we make adjustment to our tax levy number in the current 17-18 school year, and you see we very quickly get to a point where when this number was over 1 million previously, we're now down to just over $116,000. And that would be total of reserves and fund balance. So the 4%, even though this is shown a 3.28, we look down here at reserves at negative 2.2, or I'm sorry, the 2.343 in black right above the 4%, but you add that, and that's the net effect. So basically, you know, while the $1.2 million didn't cause us to immediately have to talk about any type of reductions in program or any, any layoffs or major cuts because we have enough financial resources to carry us through for a couple years. It does highlight the fact that, you know, we need to take a slightly different approach now as we go forward because we don't have the same finances available to fund possible program expansion going into the future. There's a lot of ways to approach this. Um, you know, we can look at really, although we, we do very closely watch our expenditures, 
we can tighten that down even further if we need to and try and squeeze another $100,000 out here, $100,000. Anything we do along those lines um, is gonna help further buffer this situation here. And, and again, you know, any given one of these years previous is a better than expected performance is gonna directly impact this number. And that's really our concerning year is 2021. Because once we get past that, we talk about the commensurate reduction and the big reduction in debt. Even if we were to absorb part of that towards a new debt issuance, we're still gonna be on the other side of the problem at that point, and we're gonna to start to get better. Uh, question on the budget growth item. It bounces around a little bit, pretty low this year, bounces up, goes back down. On which one? On the budget growth in terms of percentage, next to last line. Yeah. Just, are there anything like there is, specific there is something driving there. that? So what you look right there, you know, typically, this is the battery's like just dying. So if I don't press it enough, I get a, a little bit of juice, but it fades right out. Why don't you take the microphone out of the stanchion and talk on the other side? Sure. So um, what happens here in the in the 17, 18 budget, we have an artificial inflation because we have the Smarter Schools Bond Act. So we have additional revenue. When you look at non-property tax revenue, it's significantly higher because there's a million dollars added in there. And when you look at total expenditures, it's a little bit higher because we have a, we have a million dollars in revenue, we have a million dollars in expenditures. So when you jump from 17, 18 to 18, 19, that budget looks like it's only growing by 0.13%, but that million dollars that was in there is now absorbed into that growth. So while it appears that you only have a marginal increase in overall of $69,000, it's really $1,069,000. So that will affect that percentage. Does that make sense? The numbers are what the numbers are, but there's a million dollar backfill in that year. So it's all about the fluctu fluctuation in the revenue. That, and that was well, that, that's based... Which yeah, based I mean, that, that's based on, the, the, based on the, the budget growth is based on the expenditure side. So you're, you have that million dollars okay. that's, that's available for growth, but it's already counted in the previous okay. year. Yeah. You know? So the challenge will be as we go forward, you know, to see how we finish out 17, 18 and whatever we can do to, to really make this a, a, a well-performing year, which we've, we've been on track doing pretty well. So there's no reason to see that we're not gonna have a well-performing year. And then we just have to develop strategies moving forward on how we mitigate that 2021 school year. What, you know, by this time next year, you know, as we get closer to 2021, that number becomes more realistic. So reality decreases from left to right on this chart, right? So the further out you get, the more abstract it becomes because you're, you're just making some general you know, assumptions on different variables that the further you get from today, the less likely they're gonna be accurate. But the purpose of this document is to, to really keep the board and the community in touch with where are we going on the longer term? You know, are we, do we have problems? I'd rather know about a problem in 2021 today than in 1920, because in 1920 it's too late to do anything about it. So while it's not, again, that at that far out, you know, that, that could also be negative 500,000. So it gives you a, a kind of a scope of where we are that's way too low to be comfortable with going forward. Any questions on this before we jump to the next? Okay. So then one of the things that's, you know, potential uh, silver lining here is the power plant valuations. As we mentioned earlier, Roasten has this schedule where it depreciates in value or decreases in value uh, out to the 1920 school. And th these numbers mean nothing more than what they are in the agreement. They, they're no reflection potentially of reality of what the actual plant's worth. It's just back in the 13, 14 school year when these properties be sold in the bankruptcy proceeding. This is a deal that was arranged with the buyer to say, look, we need to know some definite, you know, what our tax implications are gonna be going out the next seven years. And this is just an agreement that was reached between the parties at the court. It doesn't necessarily have any reflection of what the true value of that plant is. Um, 
So, but when that expires, it now will float at market rate in theory. So in the 2021 school year, the town of Newburgh is gonna have to assign a value to that plant, somewhat hopefully realistic of what the actual value is. Um, on the other side, with the Dan Scammer plant, you have something very similar happening, but th they're not under a court order devaluation, but they're an industrial development agency pilot agreement. And pilot is payment in lieu of taxes. So they're not actually making a tax payment, they're, they're making a payment in lieu of their taxes. So again, the, the pilot payment that they're making doesn't necessarily reflect what their actual value is in, in real world. Fortunately, the plant was just sold. <laughs> so we know what it's worth, right? It was sold for $66 million just a couple months ago. So I think it'd be very hard for the buy buyer to argue that it's worth less than that because why would you pay more than what it's worth? So that's a good basis point for us right now. It gives us a, at least a, a, a piece of real information of what the market value thinks this, this, this plan is worth. So I just ran some numbers and I looked at what our 1718 pilot payment was based on Newberg's tax rate. You know, if they paid that as a tax bill, their taxable assessed value would be about 14.2 million, um, which is, you know, at the bankruptcy proceeding when they were gonna sell the plant as scrap, it was valued at $15 million. So we then, if we back out on their equalization rate, we can find out what the true value is based on that payment if it was a tax payment. True value is $41.4 million. It just sold for $66 million. So it looks like it's roughly about 67% of what the true market value is. So if we were to run that number of 66 million through what their tax payment would be, it's about $1.7 million or an increase of about $660,000. And that increase in value would be a direct decrease in the taxable liability to all the other taxpayers in, in the district. So what we need to find out is how we're gonna figure out what the fair market value of those two power plants are gonna be when these agreements expire. If I could just chime in there, the school district, um, certainly with the support of the Board of Education, has been actively meeting with officials from the town of Newburgh and officials from the town of Marlboro to, I guess, more or less get ahead of the curve, knowing that the pilot will be expiring and the court order devaluation will come to an end. And at the end of those two experiences, somewhere in the 2019, 2020 school years, because they're each a year apart, I believe, correct? Yeah. Um, the town of Newburgh is going to have to come up with what comes next, whether there's a revaluation or whether there's a pilot put together is to be determined, but we have, and by the way, with open arms and open doors, been actively meeting with Town of Newburgh and Town of Marlboro officials regularly for about a year now mm -hmm. to prepare for what's to come. Because as the Town of Newburgh, which is responsible for creating these valuations, prepares for what they have to do Quite honestly, in 2018 and 2019, we want to be at the table. So those discussions, I believe, have been very open, very frank, and very positive. We appreciate that the town of Newburgh has been open to having that dialogue with us. And as a matter of fact, we have another meeting set in the relative near future. Those are two big moments in time for this school district because it's a chance to reset history in a better way. Keep in mind, there are a couple of factors that are playing out there. Pat just described a big one, which was the sale of the Dan's Camera plant. But another one is the governor's push to close Indian Point Power Plant. So that nuclear power plant is scheduled to go offline somewhere in the relative near future in the three to five year window. I met with the CEO of um, the Roasten Power Plant. Uh, Dance Camera Power. Dance Camera. Dance Camera, Dance excuse Dance. me. Dance Camera Power Plant. Uh, the new owner. And um, he has a vision. And 
they have, it's a firm out of New York City that has purchased a number of smaller power plants and it's certainly in their strategic plan to look at what they're going to do with that power plant in the short term, but also what they're going to do with that power plant in the long term with their eye on what happens with Indian Point nuclear power plant. So it's going to be interesting to watch how those plans become something and see where their $66 million investment in this new power plant turns into something greater for what that facility will be. Remember, the conversion is also complete down there, so it's no longer a coal plant. It's now fired by natural gas. So there's really some interesting little dynamics that are going to play out over the next two to five years that will dramatically impact these charts and Pat's projections. So we're appreciative to be at the table and having these discussions. And as a matter of point two, um, we have had these similar discussions so that they're aware, is the phrase that I coined, to keep people smart. We have made sure that Senator Larkin and also Assemblyman Scartados are aware that we are working with the two municipalities so that we can try to get ahead of this rather than be behind it for the future. So. And it is interesting to, to note back when this pilot was first being proposed, the board had authorized a, a study, a valuation study. We brought an expert in who deals with valuing power plants to give a presentation so that we could argue with the town of Newburgh what that value should be. And um, I just reviewed it this morning and their estimation of the value of that plant was between 70 to 80 million dollars back in 2014 and it sold for 66 million so in the ballpark all right and that leads to questions or comments we're gonna obviously have more discussion as we get into the budget process for 1819 and we start to talk about what that looks like Sure, John. Uh, just a couple. The, the five-year plan, including the assessment error, none of the potential bright spots that you just talked about under that page, last page, are reflected in there, right? This is if no. everything stays the way it is today, right? Correct. Okay. Okay. And can you go back to the first page you showed about the revenues? I wasn't sure. I, I didn't follow it. Sure. I, I, I think the net of it is, correct me if I'm wrong, that the, the number in the paper is much higher but we did receive it. We will get. We will experience an increase in revenue, state aid revenue, but not as much as it says in the paper. Is that, well, is that right, that, or did that, you say no, we're actually going to go down? No. I mean, this is what they. This was the paper showing us a four hundred and sixty-five thousand right. six hundred and sixty-five dollar increase right. against their projected to what their proposed is. But we have to look at. You know, for us, what was what did we budget? Because we're going to go budget to budget. We can't go, you know, from a projection because we budgeted revenue. So our budget was fifteen seven one seven four fifty five. They're now projecting fifteen one ninety nine eight fifty one. So there's a you know five hundred and eighteen thousand dollar decrease between what we budgeted and what they proposed. So in the end, if you look at what we and I got the type. Yeah, I'm not following the laser. What's that? I'm not following the laser. If you could. So so this is they're saying, look, you're you're getting a four hundred and sixty-five thousand right, dollar increase that. in aid. Sure. Yeah, that's so you're they're good. saying you're getting a four hundred and sixty-five thousand dollar increase in aid because they're looking at the projected aid they're going to pay in seventeen eighteen versus the governor's proposal. Mm -hmm. So the difference between these two numbers is four hundred and sixty-five thousand, but okay. that's not what we you know we didn't budget the projected number we budgeted based off of the proposals back in january 2017. so this is our budgeted number 15 717 455. so the governor's january 2018 <coughs> proposal is 15 665 516. a difference a decrease of fifty two thousand dollars okay is our was our budget just inaccurate because if I look at no nope. our budget was based on the projections I mean it's you can say it's inaccurate based on the fact that we're not going to receive what we budgeted but the budget was based on the projections back in January and February of 2017 the budget was made made on the best available information that we had mm -hmm. on the time 
just like we're going to build a budget for 1819 based on what the governor's proposal and the legislative proposal we're going to if, if we have a legislative proposal before we're able to set the budget so we're, we're not necessarily the numbers that they're offering now are, are those are projections um, so we need to develop a budget based on a projection but reality isn't going to be that projection in this case reality you know, here was their proposal, 15,561. That was the governor's proposal in January 2017, and they're now projecting 15,199. Okay. So right there is a difference okay. of several hundred thousand dollars. Just to keep in mind, too, for, for some pieces, there's a few pieces of those categorical aids that are based upon actual usage during the school year. Right. So that's why there's projections there, but those numbers change based upon the actual services that are contracted for. Correct. whether it's BOCES aid, transportation aid, or any number of other things. So that's why there's estimations in there. Yeah. You know, and one of, the, one of the highlights to look here is, you know, one of the things that we've been seeing the last couple of years is we've been seeing our projected building aid increase, 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 which has hurt us on the levy side. So last year, we, we you know, there was a potential increase of $600,000 in building aid, which would cost us $700,000 in potential levy. So for the, by the, you know, the, the state giving us more money in building aid actually costs us money in the net effect, right? So what we see this year though is the building aid on the, the is down. Here it was three point, so it's down almost four, you know, $300,000, which results then when we plug that into that archaic tax cap calculation results in us with a little more allowable levy growth. Okay, I also see why I was getting confused. So the line item of foundational aid, you're projected in budget would be in the right place, projected higher than budget. But when you look at the line items below it, that's where it starts to go Yeah, down so if you want to look at, yeah. I mean, there's the governor's proposal and yeah. there's what our budget was. So six, you know, and these numbers, that was the governor's proposal. We then also would see a legislative proposal and th there would be some middle ground in there. And you know, that's where we base our projections off I see of. It. Okay, so nice. those numbers should be more closely aligned. I mean, look at there's 3402 on building aid, 3417 is what we budgeted. They're projecting 2967. So, you know, there's a $420,000 difference from what they originally projected. Uh, same, you know, you get slight variations. A takeaway also for perspective, there were a number of years when school districts walked into January with the governor's proposal and the governor's proposal was a, an overall reduction in the entire aid package. And then you remember also the governor put in the gap elimination adjustment, which was an additional reduction. So it was an increase with a deduction in right. it. So and you see we still have some gap gamesmanship in, in the budgeting process. This is we can the politics that. of Albany that starts in January with the governor's proposal and quite honestly ends up the last day or so of March <laughs> when they actually adopt the budget by the required date of April 1st. Knock on wood, they meet that deadline, which they have for a good number of years now. But um, that's kind of the, the waiting game that we watch and play with. And we do take an active role in meeting with our local legislators, as I said, to keep them as smart as possible. And certainly Assemblyman Scartados and Senator Larkin have been very good with Marlboro and listening to us. So uh, we're appreciative of that relationship that we have. So Pat, let me restate what I was trying to say before. So the net of it really is, for our 17-18 budget, what we had originally is now actually 51.9K less. So we're going to have to deal with that ourselves. Somehow. Well, and, and this is just the governor's proposal. Assuming it's These aren't yeah, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Chances are the, yeah. the legislative proposal is going to be significantly right, right. increased from this, and then okay. there's going to be some negotiation, right, where they come to some agreement at some but point. But if it stayed the same, that's what we would mean to Correct. us. We would have to accommodate that. If that out. number turned into, hey, this is, the, this is what your the yeah. end okay. budget is. I understand. Thank we'd be down about $52,000. Any other questions from board first? Uh, just a comment. I mean, overall, this doesn't seem that bad at all. I mean, there's a lot of positives. Even when you look at the one with the error, the 20 to 21 is, uh, or 21 to 22 is, is that the one? Yeah, that's the bad spot. But the year before is when all these things with the power plants that you described come up for decision. So if those things do swing our way, we got room, some potential there to offset what looks like a bad year. Yeah, we'd have to look at how they do it. There's some, 
you know, uh, when you look at this, the Dan Skinner pilot, when you see it expires, um, you know, in the tax cap calculation, you get penalized as you come into a pilot and you get a big windfall as you come out of a pilot. So when we came into the pilot agreement, it hurt us on our tax cap calculation. But the, the way it's calculated when you look at prior year versus next year pilot payment, coming out of it, you know, you could potentially, your, your tax cap in 2122 could be six or 7% because of the way the calculation works if that pilot expires. So, you know, we'd have to have a discussion as we get closer there, because, you know, you could say we're within the cap, but that might still be a, a significant number. It's now, a good point, too, to make also a, a key piece of legislation that I know the uh, governor's office is looking at and also the state senate is looking at is making the tax cap permanent. And in that process, they're going to tinker with how the tax cap is calculated. Um, a piece that NISBA, the New York State School Boards Association, and NISCUS, the New York State Council of School Superintendents, um, continuously pushes is for changes in the way that the cap is calculated, specifically as it re relates to pilots. So we're watching that one as closely as we possibly can, too, because a pilot is not treated the same as uh, as taxed parcels right. in the calculation of the cap. So certainly we're watching that very, very closely and we'll be having those conversations. And pilots are, are they, they're somewhat, somewhat attractive as a pilot because what a pilot does is prevents the, the property from coming back and arguing their assessment, right? So if you float the assessment at the end of the pilot agreement and the assessor picks a number and says, this is what it's worth, the, the power plant can now come in and, and fight that in court and say, no, that's not what it's worth, this is what. If you come up with an agreement, there's no ability for them to come back and argue that that's not. So it gives you a period of stability with the value of that property. And if, if you know, that's why it's so important to try and pinpoint what the actual value of those are so that if we go into a pilot agreement, we can be arguing with the town of Newburgh, or not arguing, we could be educating the town of Newburgh as to what the value of those properties are so we can get a more, you know, a number that more closely reflects what the market price should be. Patrick, I, I have a question. Uh, it, I guess this is where I get a little confused with the pilots. Because they sold the power plant now, Shouldn't we be able to negotiate that more? Nope, because the power, the pilot agreement runs with Dan Scammer Energy LLC, and Dan Scammer Energy LLC is still in existence. Okay. They sold the whole company. Let's protect it. This is what we projected was going to happen, okay. right? We, when we were talking about this, we said, look, they're going to get in this pilot agreement. They're going to do some upgrades here. That pilot agreement has significant tax advantages. It's worth money. They're going to they're gonna flip it, right? They're going to buy a broken down power plant, upgrade it, get a nice tax benefit and, and sell it and go on to the next one. And that's right. exactly what they did. Thank you. Yes, they can be. So this pilot will expire, but they could negotiate terms of a, a pilot to replace this at the expiration. Right, there's two paths at the end of the pilot. One, the town of Newburgh can approach from a, they have to come up with a valuation for the plant. Or, as I understand it, the power plant can approach the county of Orange and the IDA to try to enter into another pilot, pilot agreement. So that would be a dynamic that would have to occur on that side of the, of the ledger. Some, they could, have two, they could have a 20 year pilot, some, some places. So you're right, the term's negotiable, the, everything's in there is, is negotiable. Right, well the, right, but you know, assessed prices should, you know, when you do an assessed value, you, you wind up with a true value. So town of Newburgh has a taxable assessed value. When you, when you look at what their taxable assessed value is here, there's a commensurate true value. For this, I took the, the equalization rate for each of these years, and from 17, 18, 18, 19, 19 20, I use the 17, 18 rate, because I don't know what they're gonna be in the future. But when you make, you make the adjustments based on their equalization rate, so you have a taxable assessed value, but then you can tell what the, the true value, and the true value should be the market value. That should be what, if you put the thing up for sale, that's, that's the true value.
Correct. So you have to mention they, they're not, they're not, you know, it, it had to be, I believe it was after, if it ran more than 25% of the time, there was, there was additional community benefit. So they would pay additional money. Um, they're not, they never intended to run more than 25% of the time, which is I think why they agreed to that piece of the, the agreement because they're a, they're a peaker plan. So they run, the other day when it was five below, they were running, you know, but it, this weekend when it's 45, they're not gonna be running. So they, they, their business model, Dan Scammer, the, the company that came in and built them, their business model doesn't depend on them actually producing power to make money. They just have to have the capacity to produce power. And then they receive That's capacity payments. That's also the dynamic that I know that the new owner is also looking at, so is the region, regarding Indian Point. So that kind of changes the, the dynamic, I right. guess, as far as the ability to produce electricity for the grid overall. So the way it works, right, that you start with the cheapest power sources, like hydroelectric thing. They'll bid, you know, I'm going to throw numbers, a dollar a decatherm, right? Then some, you know, John's plant's not quite as efficient, so it costs him two dollars a decatherm to to produce. And Mr. Brooks has an old plant, and his plant costs four dollars a decatherm. Then you know, Robin's the peaker plant; she's eight dollars a decatherm. So as every day they set the price, you know, if it hits three dollars, then John's plant's running. Whoever else I said was running is running. You know, if it hits, you know, if it hits seven dollars, everybody's running except Robin because Robin's price is eight dollars. But she still gets paid just to have the ability to supply if she needs to. If the price hits eight fifty, now Robin turns the key. She starts producing electricity because her cost structure is such that she doesn't make any money unless it hits that price. So she's not going to run unless it hits that price. But just her being there, being able to supply the grid if it needs, she gets capacity payments, and that that's how they planned on. I think ultimately they planned on just fixing it up and selling it, which they did, but that was their business model to make money if it didn't sell. I, I do have to say that plant has been running because I don't live far from that plant. Oh, I look at it. You, you it's hard to tell if it's Rosen or Dan Scammer sometimes, but, you know, they've been running. Both, when it, yes, and that's so when it's as run. cold as it's going to be in the winter is when they're going to run, and when it's super hot in the summer, it's going to run. But in the spring, don't see it run. In the fall, you won't see it run because the... The, the electricity price isn't where it needs to be. So if there can be a takeaway from, from this presentation, and certainly, as, a, as I said, it's a kickoff for our budget discussions, um, we are very stable. Yeah. But we do have to very carefully watch a number of dynamics that are coming in the next few years so that we remain stable <coughs> and we make, them very, very, make some very smart decisions on how we approach the budgeting process. Um, the soft landing that the district has been planning for for a number of years is actually happening. So that coming off of some very difficult times uh, worked. Well done. And that's not just the superintendent's opinion. You know, S&P global ratings, we, when I first started here, we were, we were rating A on credit watch. Then we got upgraded to A stable. Then just in November of 2017, we were upgraded to A plus stable. In light of this, they knew that this 1.2 million occurred, but because we've had conversations with them, because we have a plan on how we're going to deal with it, they don't they don't see that as a material issue. Because they it's specifically a referenced the 1.2 million dollar loss in the A plus stable rating. So it's right. really, Pat, you've done a wonderful job in shepherding us through this process. So thank you, number sure. one. Uh, but, but the broader sense is that remember, this is the foundation for all of our discussions for building the 18-19 school year. So we just need to keep referring back to these slides as the brick and mortar that we're gonna build on. So we just have to watch that very carefully. Just one more question, Pat. You were talking about the potential positives of having a second pilot agreement which brings stability. Uh, just so I understand what you meant by that, that's assuming we get a fair assessment and a pilot that properly reflects within Correct. reason the right assessment and we can count on it as opposed to what we wound up with a plant that was assessed as it was going to get junked and then wound up running. So right. we've been and, and opposed to so, you know okay. them saying it has a true value of two hundred and fifty six yeah. million when it might actually be eighty yeah. million. And right. that's when they're gonna come back and say, No, that number's way off bait. Yeah. You, you you get some stability. Assuming so if everybody can that. agree that that's a reasonable number it's not a bad avenue to address. Assuming logic prevails. Correct. <laughs> okay. I just want to make sure I understand. 
it's many a slip because we were away. talking so negative about the pilot for the last five years. Well, right. We just talked about it in a positive sense, and I had to shift. Well, you can see. I mean, means. the pilot you're paying as if it's a true value of 41 million. You sold for 66. So our argue, argument is, it's not an accurate number to be using for the pilot. Thank you, Pat. Which I'll still argue that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to public comment on agenda items. Is there any public comment on agenda items? Okay. Moving on to number four, consent, consent agenda. Resolved that the Board of Education, upon the recommendation of the Superintendent of Schools, approve and adopt the personnel recommendations, textbook, Cronica de una muerte anunciado, Special Olympics Unified Sports contract, claims audit letter and report, unofficial BOE meet meeting minutes from December 21st, 2017, Wappinger's Central School District Health and Welfare Contract and the financial reports for December. Can I get a motion to approve and adopt the consent agenda? James, second, Joanne. I do have a question. Any discussion? I do on the Special Olympics. I have a couple of questions on it, which I'm thrilled about. Um, so. My question with this is, is this just for the high school now? Or is this going to be the, what we had originally started was for the elementary school all the way up to the high school? This has nothing to do with Special Olympics, except that it's connected with Special, but not the actual Special Olympics. This is a unified sports program for our high school program. Okay, so this is where I'm getting confused. This is the one we spoke about, Is right. this the basketball? Okay, so this is my other question with that is, and I'm glad because um, Mr. Brooks will do a beautiful job. He's always good with the kids. So I had noticed that they have to have a, a, a buddy with them. So how many kids do we need to do the basketball team, and do we have enough to do it? That's or what have, we're have working we on. Out yet? That's what we're working on right now. So this is just for the basketball. Yeah. Okay. And the contract enables that program. Yes. Yeah. Okay. And this also gives the transportation. And we'll get them their uniforms, it says. Yes. yes. You had said Mrs. O'Donnell said she was great. She was working on that. So I have to thank you all for doing this. I think this is a wonderful thing, and I'm excited to see come and see the kids play. And I've always been a little a part of this, so this is very very exciting. So great. Thank you. A quick question for Mike on the uh, personnel recommendations. There's an elementary school teacher. Is that to replace one of the two that are retiring? That's correct, and we will have the next one, hopefully at the next board meeting, if not, then the second meeting of February. Okay, thanks. I meant to ask that earlier today, but didn't yeah. get a chance. I was just going to ask, the, um, was there another posting put out for the second elementary school teacher? We did. We Recently? Re we, re we reposted uh, prior to the weekend um, so we can re-canvas the, uh, the pool out there because okay. we will accept nothing but the best. Okay, just ask. Good. Thank so after you. A, actually a very exhaustive process, let, let me let the board take their action and I'll get on my soapbox. <laughs> Any further discussion? Cast your vote. The motion has been carried four to zero. Madam President, if it would be okay with you, I'd like to introduce some people. Sounds great. Fantastic. So as I said, after an exhaustive uh, process that looked at hundreds of applications and uh, tens of uh, interviews and then demo lessons uh, for two open probationary positions, um, our 
very dedicated staff was able to find one. And we are beginning the process all over again to find the second one because, as I said, um, we will not bring someone to the board that is not top-notch. So I'm actually saying that as closely as I can, or as clearly as I can, as I introduce Deb Marone, who is the candidate that was the successful one that came out of the search process. Deb has actually done a number of leave replacements for us and has really been a, 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 a great person to go to for things that we needed done in some very short-term uh, perspectives. I think there was a period of time where you were a librarian at the two, at the elementary school, at the middle school, and, and Deb, you really have done a nice job. I've been in Deb's classroom a number of times and uh, had some multiple interviews with you over the course of the last uh, uh, year and a half or so, and um, I congratulate you because it's not an easy process, and your grace and dignity through the process was wonderful, and your abilities in the classroom uh, will continue to shine because I know you're a professional that wants to do better every single day. So welcome to Marlboro. Yes. Now, Deborah does come to us from Highland, New York. She has a childhood education certification in grades one through six, early childhood education in birth through two. She did her undergraduate work and has a, at SUNY New Paltz and has a Bachelor's of Arts in Childhood Education English. So welcome, Deborah. We also just appointed our assistant principal, no longer interim assistant principal, Dara Kaplan. She's from Rock Hill. She has certifications in pre-kindergarten, kindergarten, and grades one through six. She also has a school district leader certification and a school building leader certification. Her undergraduate degree from Long Island University Brooklyn campus, campus is a Bachelor of Arts in Elementary Education, and she has graduate degrees from Toro University as a Master's in Special Education and SUNY Stony Brook in her post-master's educational leadership work. So Dara, welcome to Marlboro. Congratulations and thank you. Moving on, on to number five, old business. Is there any old business that the board would like to discuss? Oh. New business. Any other items? Uh, does, does the board want me, and I've had a little bit of time to think about it, do you want me to bring to the first meeting of February a... Um, uh, a sample discussion point and action item for a summer calendar? I think so. Okay. And then we can obviously adjust it and discuss it based on what our um, yeah. thoughts are. Okay. Yes, right, so we'll I do that so. for the February meeting. Yes, I think we really also ran short last year. And yeah. Got a little crazy. Right. Okay. Moving on to number six recognition of district residents. We do have an executive session scheduled for this, for this evening for the purpose of employment history of a particular person or persons, the pending or current litigation and collective bargaining negotiations. Can I get a motion? Did I say all three? Okay. Can I get a motion to enter into executive session? James, second Joanne. All in favor, say aye. 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 Any opposed? Yes. Yeah. No. <laughs> it's generally about proposed, pending, or current litigation. And once it becomes a finalized item, if it goes in that direction, then it would become a public item. 